So I am very excited to introduce uh, Dr. William Irvine. He's a professor of philosophy at Wright State in Dayton. And um, I actually, we were talking before this, before the start of that, I actually met um, Dr. Irvine before this when I was in graduate school, at the University of Western Ontario, who's giving a paper on children's rights and had nothing to do with stoicism at the time. I don't know. I think at that point you weren't actually doing stoicism. No. And I didn't actually know I knew him until I picked up his book on stoicism. So that was a, a guide to the good life was the book that I picked up of his. And I know he's working on another. He can tell you about that. Um, but when I picked up his book on stoicism, when I took when I took an interest in it, that's when I realized that, oh, this was the same person I'd met um, several years ago. So Dr. Irvine has been writing. Um, there's now several is it three books now on stoicism that you've got uh, three. three yeah. Um, yeah, three. Call it three. Call it three. We'll go with three. So today he's going to present for those of you who don't know what stoicism is. That's good. It, you don't have to know anything about it. He's going to sort of give you the basics and talk about his own sort of stoic journey and how that applies in the 21st century. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Irvine. Welcome. Uh, oh, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. And a good evening to all of those of you in the audience. I want to start by uh, thanking uh, Dr. Vopat and, uh, and Youngstown State for giving me, for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, I've been doing a fair number of these. They're interesting. You know, I teach in the classroom, but, but I love to teach for a broader audience as well. And, and the books, that's part of what it's about. So I consider myself first and foremost a teacher. And then there are different ways the teaching uh, is expressed. So this evening, I'm going to be telling you about Stoicism. Uh, it's one of many ancient schools of philosophy. But when I talk about schools of philosophy, you're likely to get the wrong idea. Uh, you yourself may have attended what these days counts as a school of philosophy. Uh, you might have attended, uh, for example, you might have taken a philosophy class in a university that had a philosophy department. But your experience was nothing like that of a student at one of the ancient schools. In ancient Greece and Rome, the schools of philosophy were run as businesses. Now they're run as educational institutions. Uh, you know, run by state, private schools, but they were um, businesses. Students paid fees to their teacher, and it was by means of these fees that the teacher, who was normally a, almost always, I think, as far as I know, a man, uh, that's how he made his living. Um, as businesses, schools of philosophy were exposed to market forces. Uh, this meant that they had to fight for market share. There were any number of schools that a student could attend. So the heads of schools uh, were compelled to offer a service that the students were willing to pay for. Otherwise they would go out of business. So it was that kind of math that was at work. And of course, if they folded this, the philosophy that they taught in their school would in many cases have gone extinct. And there were lots of ancient philosophies that had schools but couldn't draw students and so went extinct as, well, uh, as a result. And that's presumably the reason that today we talk about the Stoics, their school survived and, and, and spawned new schools. Um, it was one of the most successful ancient schools, but we don't talk about the philosophy taught by the Anasarian school for instance, that school of which I know little uh, because it flopped. And so it didn't leave many records behind. It uh, doesn't have any modern uh, uh, correlate. For a modern analog of an ancient school of philosophy, uh, you could consider schools of martial arts. I know that sounds far-fetched, but it really is uh, similar. An internet search reveals the existence of lots of competing schools of martial arts and all of them are run as businesses. Uh, some schools teach widely known forms of martial arts like judo and karate. Other schools teach a version of martial arts that um, uh, tries to blend together multiple different uh, kinds of martial arts. So, so one of the things you can do if you wanna start a school of martial arts is you can invent a new form of martial arts. You can take together bits and pieces of currently existing forms of martial arts and come up with your own version and then start a school for that. Um, 
Now, if you attract students, good for you. You make a living and your school uh, spreads and your students might start schools on their own. And if you don't, uh, school ends and that form of martial arts might die with it. Contrast this with the way philosophy is taught in modern universities. As a professor of philosophy, I don't have to fight for market share. I don't have to fret whether my classes will draw sufficient students. Now, actually, uh, I don't know if you uh, realize this, but Wright State has declared retrenchment. <laughs> and I've been told that 49 people in the uh, liberal arts department are going to lose their job. These are tenured people. So this was written before I got that news. So maybe I do need to worry about these things, but we'll put that in the background. Uh, and here's, here's the amazing thing. I don't even have to offer a product that students are willing to pay for. And let me explain. My classes tend to be filled with students who, if I asked them why they signed up, for the most part would say that they had to sign up. They had to take philosophy so they could graduate, so they could fulfill their dream of becoming, say, an investment banker. So they didn't want to take my class. Someone said, you have to take uh, his class. Um, it's unlikely, too, that the students who are in my class drew my university on the basis of its philosophy department. You know, they didn't go through several different uh, universities and say, well, which one has the best philosophy department? They didn't even know philosophy existed. Um, and uh, they didn't even, in fact, know whether there was a philosophy, what it was, whether we had a, a program. Uh, they had other things in mind, and this is just something that comes along with the education. Uh, it's hard for a modern philosophy professor like myself to imagine what it must have been like to run a school of philosophy in the ancient world. Imagine the feeling that if you didn't offer a philosophy that students were willing to pay for, you would, within a short period of time, find yourself making a living not as a teacher, but as, say, a stonemason, and that would be a, a brutal alternative to uh, teaching in a classroom. And this presumably would have had a profound effect on what you taught in your class and how you taught it. Because they had to attract students, the heads of the ancient schools of philosophy had to offer something that students, or more precisely, their parents, the parents of the students, were willing to pay for because it would typically be the parents who paid the fees. And this in turn meant two things. First, in the schools, they taught skills that would be useful to students in their subsequent careers. And this would be a big issue for the parents. And high on the list of things that would be useful would have been ability in speaking and argumentative uh, skills. And this is because most of the students in these schools uh, would go on to practice law or go into politics, where argumentative skills and speaking skills were very important. So that's one thing you had to offer in your school. Second, the schools offered advice on how students could best conduct their everyday life. And in its grandest form, this advice would constitute what I call a philosophy of life. Such a philosophy has two components. It tells you what uh, things in life are most worth having, and it provides you with a strategy for attaining those things that are worth having. The contrast with modern philosophy is striking. Philosophy departments still try to develop their students' argumentative skills, but in many cases, they no longer attempt to provide students with a philosophy of life. It's true that we teach our students ethics, both theoretical and applied, in part so they could become people who are good in the moral sense of the word, but this is quite different from instructing them on what they ought to do in daily living if they wish to have a good life. Indeed, I would argue that it's not only possible, but surprisingly easy for a person who is good in the moral sense of the word to end up having a bad life, either because he chooses the wrong goals in everyday living. He not, never wrongs another human being in everyday living, but he just chooses the wrong goals. Or second alternative, he chooses the right goals but pursues them in a thoughtless manner and therefore never attains those goals. In either of those cases, even though he never wronged anybody in his entire life, he will end up having a bad life. Because we don't provide our students with a philosophy of life, 
Most of them leave our classes wanting pretty much what they wanted before being exposed to philosophy, namely a job that will let them, I don't know, acquire a cool car, wear fashionable clothes, live in a big house located in a desirable neighborhood, filled with high-end appliances. See, I'm an old guy now. I have no idea what's in the minds of these 20-year-olds, so I'm just making stuff up here. And of course, the latest electronic gadgets. And it isn't just college students whose life is unaffected by their exposure to philosophy. The same can be said of their professors. If you encounter a philosophy professor off campus, he's likely to be pretty much indistinguishable from say, an accountant. Now it's true that accountants have cooler cars than philosophy profs do and live in bigger houses as well. But this I would maintain is not because of a difference in our values. It's just that the accountants have more disposable income than we do. And if you upped our wages, we would be on their tails. We would get those cars. And before long, we'd be breaking ground for construction of a, Mc, of a McMansion the way they do. In the ancient world, this wouldn't have been the case, though. The philosophers who ran schools of philosophy would have personally adopted the philosophy of life that they taught their students. And this adoption would have affected how they dressed and ate, where they lived, and how they related to other people, and countless other details of daily life. You would be a living embodiment of the philosophy of life that you were teaching. Students who attended schools of philosophy would also, if they took their schooling seriously, have been personally transformed by their education. They wouldn't just think differently than they formerly did, they would live differently as well. Consequently, in the ancient world, if you met the head of a school of philosophy or a graduate of his school, you would have quickly sensed that this person was marching to the beat of a different drummer. He would value things that most people don't value, and he'd be utterly indifferent to some of the things that most people crave. Let's turn our attention to the philosophy of life that has won my heart and mind, and, and that's the philosophy espoused by the ancient Stoics. Uh, but before I describe Stoic, uh, the Stoic philosophy of life, uh, let me take a moment to put the Stoics into their proper historical and philosophical context. Stoicism was invented by Greek philosopher Zeno of Citium in about 300 BC. And remember, we talked about martial arts and how you can form a new school of martial arts by combining the fighting styles of multiple ones and come up with your own mix. Uh, that's basically what Zeno did. By the way, there were a whole bunch of Zenos in the ancient world. A Zeno of Citium uh, is the one who started um, uh, Stoicism. So he borrowed elements from the Cynic school of philosophy, the Megarian school of philosophy, and Plato's Academy, mixed them together to form his own new philosophy. So uh, it's, it's an amalgam of different philosophies into one new brew. Later on, the Romans, so he was a Greek, uh, later on, the Romans imported Stoicism and put their own spin on it. Um, in the Stoic books that I've written and in the remarks I make this evening, I'm interested primarily in Roman Stoicism. Uh, there's two reasons for this. Number one is um, um, almost all of the writings of the Greek uh, Stoics have been lost, so we don't know what they said except for secondhand reports. Uh, we have many, many writings from the Roman um, Stoics. And second thing is, I think Roman Stoicism has most to offer to 21st century individuals like ourselves. Uh, they speak to us uh, in a very direct way. And, you know, you can look at this advice that was offered 2,000 years ago, and you realize, well, you know, it still rings true. I suspect that all of you have heard of, or maybe even read the Stoics, but perhaps without knowing that they were Stoics. For instance, you probably have heard about Marcus Aurelius, uh, and, uh, but maybe not because he was a Stoic, but because he was one of the greatest Roman emperors. 
Uh, Seneca and Epictetus were also Roman Stoics. Uh, the names aren't as familiar. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is the works of these three Stoics, uh, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus, Epictetus uh, routinely dominate Amazon's ancient philosophy bestsellers list. So they have a following. Like any philosophy of life, Stoicism has two components. First, it tells us what things in life are most worth attaining. And second, it tells us how best to attain those things, okay? What should you be aiming at and how can you get to the thing you should be aiming at? And you notice one of those without the other would be pointless. You need the two of those together to get someplace interesting. This means that Stoicism is not a religion. Um, the primary concern of most religions, after all, is helping us have a good afterlife. Uh, more precisely, they tend to be relatively unconcerned with how we spend our days, as long as we don't spend them doing things that will jeopardize our afterlife. The primary concern of philosophies of life, by way of contrast, is with helping us have a good life, a good here and now. Um, and they themselves would have believed in the gods because back then everybody did. It's just common sense that there were gods. Um, that They were more open. You know, they, they didn't know whether there would be an afterlife or not. Uh, and so their idea was, you know, we, we've got life for sure. So let's live it to the fullest and let's live it the right way. And if there's an afterlife, okay, then there is, but we can't control that. So we're not going to obsess over that. What should a person do then who wishes to have both a good life and a good afterlife? My advice would be to supplement whatever religious belief you think will get you into heaven. So that part's fine if you have a religious belief. If you don't, that's fine too. Take care of heaven that way. But pick a philosophy of life that will enable you to flourish during your time on earth. And along these lines, let me point out that Stoicism seems particularly compatible with Christianity. And this is in part because the early Christians were inf influenced by the Stoics. And indeed, when modern Christians read the Stoics, they're likely to experience a form of deja vu. Epictetus, for example, counsels us to distinguish between things we can control and things we can't control. And his advice is to focus ourselves, our, our energies on things we can control. Because you know what, if you can't control something and you're worried about it, uh, that's a waste of time. And it's a waste of your life to be worried over something you have no control over. Christians reading Epictetus giving this advice might be reminded of the so-called serenity prayer often uh, attributed to 20th century theologian uh, Reinhold, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. And it goes like this, and I'm sure most of you have heard it before. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, Niebuhr, one, six, one suspects, knew his Stoics. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a outright plagiarism, but it leans heavily on Epictetus. Along similar lines, Christians would appreciate Marcus Aurelius's injunction that we, quote, love mankind. Uh, that's a very Christian sentiment. Suppose, though, someone doubts that there is a hereafter. This person would do well to acquire a philosophy of life. After all, for the person in question, the here and now is all he's got. It's sensible, therefore, that he um, do what he can to increase his chances of spending it happily and productively, as, as happily and productively as he can. I would argue that by adopting a time-tested philosophy of life, he can prevent himself from wasting the one earthly life he has to live. Wasting it by spending his days pursu pursuing worthless baubles or pursuing in a foolish manner things that are in fact worth attaining, but because he's pursuing them in a foolish manner, he never succeeds in obtaining them. And what, according to Stoic philosophy, is most, is most worth attaining? In one word, tranquility. Uh, our goal in life, they said, should be to attain and then maintain 
our tranquility. But having said that, several clarifications are in order. To begin with, it's important that we realize that tranquility uh, that the Stoics uh, sought was not the kind of tranquility that you can get from ingesting a, a Xanax or uh, enjoying a third martini, uh, nor was it a kind of emotional numbness. Uh, for the Stoics, tranquility meant the absence, to the extent possible, of negative emotions, such as grief, anger, fear, anxiety, and envy. They're negative emotions because when you experience them, they make you feel bad. The Stoics had nothing against positive emotions, though, including feelings of delight, a sense of awe, and the most positive of emotions, joy. Uh, so the phrase joyful Stoic is not an oxymoron. Now, if you take anything away from tonight's lecture, I want you to take this. The uppercase S Stoics were not lowercase S Stoical. They weren't. If you look up stoical in a dictionary, you'll get the wrong idea altogether. So the uppercase S Stoics, the people who, who believed in this ancient philosophy, weren't glum and stiff. They weren't emotional icebergs who stood mutely and took whatever life could throw at them. To the contrary, they appear to have been a rather cheerful bunch of individuals. I was surprised when I read that because like everybody else, I assumed they would be stoical and they would be these icebergs. And yet they had a reputation for being cheerful. Those who knew them seemed to have loved them and the Stoics seemed to have requited this love. Although Stoicism was quite popular in ancient Greece and Rome and remained popular through the 19th century. By the 20th century, it was widely ignored. So I was a philosophy major in the early 1970s, so long ago. Uh, and as a philosophy major, I did encounter the Stoics, but it was in a logic class rather than a, an ordinary philosophy class. And this is because the Stoics, besides developing a philosophy of life, were some of the preeminent logicians of their time. They developed the propositional logic that uh, is uh, uh, commonly used in, um, in computers. It's computer logic. They had the first primary insights into that kind of logic. In the philosophy classes I took way back then in the 70s, the professors had little interest in talking about philosophies of life. In fact, they seemed to think that developing such a philosophy was not the proper job of a philosopher. And they made it clear that if we wanted to succeed in our philosophical careers, we needed to, we needed to focus our attention on academic debates that had been going on for centuries. And that if they ever could be settled, and it's unlikely that they would be, if they ever could be settled, would have little impact on our non-professional lives. And that was uh, disappointing to me because I came into philosophy having read uh, people like um, Henry David Thoreau and thinking, you know, I, I actually want to get deeper into this notion of a philosophy of life. And then it turned out that um, we didn't do it anymore. We didn't do that sort of thing. Uh, in a philosophy department. Fortunately, all this has changed uh, at many universities, including uh, there at Youngstown State. Philosophy students have the opportunity to explore philosophies of life, including Stoicism. Uh, and that's wonderful. And I wish that had been the case when I was a, uh, an undergrad. In the mid 2000s, I was doing research on human desire uh, the question, the research question was, why do we want the things that we want? And in the process of doing this research, I came across the Stoic philosophy of life. I gave it a try, and I found that it did a wonderful job of preventing me from experiencing negative emotions. I was hooked. And as soon as I finished writing my book on human desire, I set to work on the book that became my guide to the good life, the ancient art of Stoic joy. As a newly converted Stoic, I felt I had a duty to share this life-altering philosophy with the world at large. I wrote the guide fully aware that it would be difficult to find a publisher. 
there didn't, after all, seem to be much of a market for books on Stoicism. And to illustrate this point, let me share a few numbers with you. If you go on Amazon and do an advanced search for books written in English with the word Stoic in their title that existed in January of 2008, which is the time I was looking for a publisher, uh, you will find that there were a total of 200 titles at that time about books about Stoicism. Stoicism. Many of those books, though, were written by the ancient Stoics themselves, and they were just translations, various people doing various translations. Others of those 200 books were written by scholars, primarily for other scholars that just did a kind of technical terminology and trying to figure out what exactly the Stoics had meant. And only a few, a handful, attempted to introduce Stoicism to general audiences. I looked at that and I thought, well, that's crazy. The world needs to know about uh, this philosophy. And I also thought that's going to be an obstacle to getting it published because any publisher wants to sell lots and lots of books. And if there simply is no market out there, books aren't going to get sold. So in order to get a book published, you uh, submit what's called a proposal. Uh, and in the proposal, you not only describe the book you're writing, but you provide evidence that you're capable of writing such a book. And most important, you provide evidence that a market exists for the kind of book you're writing. And as the numbers I uh, just provided indicate, uh, it was questionable whether there was indeed a market for my book. Uh, I therefore proceeded on the assumption that the book was unlikely to find a publisher, that if it did find one, maybe a dozen copies would sell, and half of those would be for purchased by my friends who felt a social obligation to buy them and who might or might not actually read them. So I went in with very low expectations uh, and I thought maybe I can pull over a fast one on some, some unfortunate publisher somewhere. But in the end, I did find a publisher and, uh, uh, and it turned out my timing was impeccable because I got in on what appears to have been the ground floor of the 21st century Stoic Renaissance. So in this century, uh, in the last 20 years, in particular in the last 10 years, Stoicism has just uh, increased dramatically in uh, popular interest. Uh, now, rest assured that this timing was not the result of foresight on my part. I attribute it to dumb luck, okay? I just got to be at the right place at the right time. And to appreciate the magnitude of this renaissance in interest in Stoicism, here's another Amazon search that you can do. Uh, I just did this to prepare for uh, tonight's talk. Search for books in English with the word Stoic in the title that were published last month namely that were published during February. You'll get 40 hits. Conclusion, in February last month, books on Stoicism were being published at the rate of more than one book per day, which is astonishing. And it's a vastly different literary landscape that existed back in 2008. I'd love to be able to explain the ongoing Stoic Renaissance, but I find the whole phenomenon rather mysterious. There's evidence to suggest that the Silicon Valley was the epicenter for this renaissance, but it isn't clear why or how it could have played this role. One easy explanation for the current um, popularity of Stoicism is its hackability. Uh, that's a word I hate, that word of hacking something, but it's the right word to use. Stoicism is a philosophy that's easy to explain and easy to disassemble into actionable strategies for living. So it's hackable in that sense. The same cannot be said of, say, the philosophy of Hegel. You can't hack Hegel. You've got to take the whole thing, and it's going to take a while. Uh, but this explanation clearly doesn't get to the bottom of things, since the hackability of uh, Stoicism was there throughout the 20th century. But during that time, Stoicism dropped off the cultural radar. 
And before I move on, uh, uh, another aside is in order in, uh, in my book, Guide to the Good Life. I take a few sentences to, re to describe what I refer to as stealth stoicism. And I explain to readers that they can test drive stoicism without anyone else being any the wiser. Um, I thought that was a good strategy. You know, there'd be people who would say, you know, people are going to think I'm nuts if I go around and tell them I'm a stoic. Uh, so I said, you can do it in private. Nobody needs to know. You don't need to shave your head or anything. Uh, you will know and they don't need to know. Uh, in recent years, though, I've started receiving emails from people who were puzzled, who read the book and were puzzled why anybody would want to be a stealth stoic. Uh, and uh, indeed, when you look at the social media, uh, which, by the way, I make a point of not doing, um, you find that the current consensus seems to be, why keep anything a secret? Uh, and I try to explain to, to people who raise this issue with me, I try to explain that back in the day, way back at the turn of the millennium, it would have been kind of weird to go around telling people that you were a stoic. Um, it would have been a surefire conversation stopper. But all of that has changed. So these days, among young people, it's actually kind of cool to be a stoic. How cool is that, right? The world has changed. I've been told that this evening I would be uh, addressing a mixed audience. Uh, some of you have read, I've been told, uh, my guide to the good life. And thanks to you. Thanks very much. And I hope the book didn't disappoint you. But there are doubtless others in the audience who don't know a lot about Stoicism. And if you're in this category, um, you came to the right place, because I'm going to give you a very gentle, gentle introduction to Stoicism. Um, I'm going to do it by uh, introducing you to some basic Stoic psychological strategies. So the Stoics were the preeminent psychologists of their time. They had some important psychological insights that we've only started re-exploring in the last uh, half century. Um, and it turns out that these modern psychologists keep realizing, uh, yeah, these, these strategies work. They're quite effective. Um, most people try to uh, gain happiness by getting what they want. So what they do is they look in, them, them, uh, in themselves and they say, what do I want? And uh, then they realize, well, I don't have it. And that makes me unhappy. And they have this theory that if they get the thing they want, then they will be happy, that they will live happily ever after. The problem is that before long, you get what you want. And before long, uh, in a matter of days or even hours, they start taking whatever it is they work to get. They start taking it for granted and therefore are no closer to happiness than was formerly the case. And you might have had that experience uh, in, the, in your own life. You work really hard to get something and you get it and you've got that glow and that glow fades and then you're right back to where you were before. Uh, psychologists have a name for this phenomenon. They call it the hedonic treadmill. So uh, you, you have desires, you work hard to fulfill the desires, you're happy for a while, and then you form new desires and you're just back where you were before. Many ancient thinkers, including the Buddha, have realized that there's a way to get off this treadmill, a real easy way. What you need to do is instead of working to get what you want, you need to strive to want the things you already have. Okay, you don't get, if you work to get the new things that you want, you'll find new, new things to want. You'll have to work to get them. But if you can only teach yourself to be satisfied with what you already have, then happiness is there. Um, okay, you say point taken, but how can you learn to want the things you already have? The trick, the Stoics said, is to develop your ability to appreciate, accept, and even savor the life you find yourself living. You know what? We all have this dream life. And, uh, you know, the idea that if only I had that life, I would live happily ever after. Um, and guess what? Your dream life is someone else's dream life. Look at your situation. There are many, many very impoverished people who don't have computers to watch things on, who maybe didn't eat today and so on. And if you told them about your existence, they would say, ah, 
that's what I dream of becoming someday. And if only I became that, I would be happy, a happy, happy person. Uh, you're living their life. So what do you do? Oh, you come on with some new dream life that's different than yours. And, uh, and it's just a, it's a game you can't win. So how do you come to appreciate the life you find yourself living? Uh, one way, the Stoics said, is by employing the, the psychological technique known as negative visualization. Uh, this technique is uh, easy to learn, easy to use, and surprisingly effective. So we're going to give it a try now. The most basic negative visualization exercise involves what else? Your vision. Okay, so we're going to do this exercise. I want you all to close your eyes right now. Just close your eyes. I can see you remember. Keep them closed. Are they closed? Good. Okay. Now I want you to imagine that you can never again open them. They're going to stay the way they now are forever for the rest of your life. Okay. Now open them and look around. Isn't that grand? Isn't it miraculous that you possess such an ability? Realize, though, that only a minute ago, you probably took your sight utterly for granted. It was there, and it's always been there, and you assume it's always going to be there. But it doesn't have to be that way. Things happen. Now, it could be that there's somebody in this audience who's blind, and it wouldn't have been a very useful exercise for them. So let me describe some other ways in which you can negatively visualize. Uh, this time, go ahead and keep your eyes open. I want you to think about your life, your relationships, and your circumstances. And I want you to pick something that plays a particularly important role in your life. And then, you know, it depends on your circumstances, which thing you pick. It might be your spouse or your partner, it might be your job, it might be your children. Now take a few seconds to imagine that thing disappearing from your life. And this might mean imagining that your spouse has just filed for divorce. Or it might mean imagining that you just got an email telling you that you've been laid off from your job. Or it might mean you imagining that you just got a phone call from the police informing you that your child has been in, in an accident. Now that you have your topic, you can do the visualization. Think of the consequences that the disappearance you're imagining would have for you and the life you're living. Form a mental image of what it would be like, and even mentally fill in some of the details. And then let that image sink in for a few seconds. Okay, now, once again, return to life as usual. Congratulations, you've just practiced stoicism. Okay, what does it mean to practice stoicism? It means to uh, practice the stoic psychological strategies. That's how you put it into practice in your life. And there's half a dozen or so of these, strateg of these strategies, easy to learn, easy to experiment with, and um, quite effective, at least in my life. And in your life just now, you might have noticed that it's changed your attitude toward whatever it was that you uh, were negatively visualizing. Uh, so, and that could play out in the next few hours or days of your uh, life. Uh, suppose that in your negative visualization, you imagine that your child had indeed been in an accident. When you next encounter this child, you might notice that you're behaving differently toward her than would otherwise have been the case. In normal circumstances, uh, when you saw her, you would simply have acknowledged her existence. Hey, how you doing? But this time, when you encounter her, you might find yourself savoring her presence in your life. Big hug. Because you allowed yourself to form this idea that she could go away. She could disappear. 
she could stop being part of your life. And you might find yourself wanting to do things with her that would be impossible if she ceased to be part of your life. You might have a strong urge to read to her. She's always asking you to, but you're normally too busy to. And now you might think that's actually a really good idea. Or playing a game with her or singing a silly song together. Just that little sort of stuff. It's so easy when you're taking somebody or something for granted. You know, you, you don't savor it. It's just there. You're barely aware of it. And as a result of engaging in, in negative visualization, those activities I just described might turn out to be the high point of your day. Uh, they're there all the time, they're available to you, but you don't do them, you take them for granted. Negative visualization can be effective even if your situation in life is quite difficult. And that's because all, it's almost always the case that whatever your situation is, it could be worse even much worse than it is. Keeping this in mind can help you not only cope with your circumstances, but keep an upbeat attitude as you do. You find yourself living in a crude cabin? Don't spend your time there thinking about what it would be like to live in a mansion. Think instead about what it would be like to be living in a tent instead of a cabin, or what it would be like to be living with no shelter at all. Do that and you will appreciate the, the cabin. You will count yourself very fortunate to have it. The sense of appreciation. So this negative, visualiz negative visualization brings on this feeling of appreciation. But the interesting thing is because you're human, it wears off. It lasts for a while and then it wears off. But the beautiful thing is uh, negative visualization is like the prescription ointment that says apply as needed, right? So uh, when it does wear off, you can negatively visualize again. It can be done almost anywhere, in your kitchen, in your workplace, in a battlefield trench. It can be used even as you're being wheeled off for surgery, because uh, as they're wheeling you off, you can stop to think about how lucky you are that your condition isn't inoperable, that there's something they can do for you. It didn't have to be that way. Okay, let's switch to a second stoic uh, psychological technique. I call it the last time meditation. Um, to set the stage for learning this technique, uh, I've got to give you some gloomy news. I'm sorry, but it's part of the job. And the news is that for everything you do, there will be a last time that you do it. And this is a direct consequence of your mortality. Because you will someday die, there will be a last time that you tie your shoes, pay your taxes, and eat chocolate. There will be a last time you brush your teeth, lay your head on a pillow, and close your eyes. There will also be a last breath that you take. Uh, sometimes people know that they're doing something for the last time. Uh, this is the case with a condemned prisoner eating his last meal. More commonly though, people do something for the last time without realizing that it's the last time they will do it. They instead do it on the assumption that they'll do it again in the future, maybe hundreds of times. Look back at your life though, and you'll realize that there's already been a whole bunch of things that you've done for the last time. There was the last time you played hopscotch, the last time you made a phone call with a rotary phone, and some of you, if you're, if you're young enough, have never done that. Uh, uh, there's a last time you wrote a document uh, on a typewriter. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on a typewriter. That was back when cut and paste wasn't a metaphor. You had scissors, you had glue. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, those are things that the last time you did them, it was the last time, you, but you didn't realize it. Uh, now realize that many of the things you're doing in everyday life, it's conceivable that you're doing them for the last time. It's possible that you've eaten chocolate for the last time. I sincerely hope that this isn't the case, but only time will tell. The knowledge that you're doing something for the last time can have a profound impact on the experience. Consider, for example, the difference between going to a favorite restaurant on the assumption that you can do so at will in the future and going to that restaurant on the night it's slated to close. 
the last time dining experience is likely to be much more meaningful than the previous experiences were, in part because, like a condemned prisoner, you won't take that last meal for granted. You'll know this is it. This is the last time I'm going to do this. Likewise, consider the difference between giving your lover a kiss as you head off to work and giving your lover a kiss as you embark on a potentially dangerous uh, journey, as you head off, for example, for a tour of duty in the army. The first kiss is uh, done on the assumption that there will be another kiss later in the day. Honey, I'm home. And it's therefore no big deal. And it's forgotten within moments of giving it. The soldier giving the second kiss, though, does so in the knowledge that it might be his last. Maybe his last kiss with her. And maybe even his last kiss, period. It puts a different spin on an activity if you do it in the realization that it could be the last time you do it. Like negative visualization, the last time meditation is easy for you to learn and easy to do. Periodically during the day, you simply pause to consider the possibility that you're doing whatever it is you're doing for the last time. You're eating chocolate or kissing your lover. As you do so, consider the possibility that this is the last time you'll do it. And you will likely find that as a result, both the chocolate and the kiss will be notably sweeter. Now, I don't want you to go through life all day long thinking that this is the last time and having negative thoughts. These are flashing thoughts that pop into your head and then pop back out of your head, okay? And uh, so, so it isn't an ongoing thing because that would be a recipe for depression, but it's a technique that you use in a, a controlled kind of way. By thinking in last time terms, you simultaneously invest in experience with special significance and you focus your attention on it. And as a result, doing the, fast, the last time, uh, uh, doing a last time meditation, you can find yourself living in the moment, which is a really strange feeling, okay? So let's pause here to talk about what it means to live in the moment. And you've probably heard that expression. Uh, those of you who have done Zen meditation, and I hope all of you give it a try even at the beginning level because you can learn a very important uh, uh, um, lesson right off because what your teacher will do is have you sit down and then give you the instructions of uh, focus on your breath, uh, don't, don't think. It's not done quite that brutally because they can't tell you to don't think, but uh, they say, just let your mind go blank. And you think, well, that's easy to do. And that's going to be rather enjoyable because I get to sit here with an empty mind. But what you quickly discover is that having a mind without thoughts is almost impossible to do, at least at first. And if you do enough meditation, you get better at it. Because what you'll notice is, yeah, your mind will be blank and then a thought will pop into it. And you'll think, uh oh, whoops, concentrate on breathing. And that thought will go away. And then another 15 seconds later, another thought will pop into it. Uh, your mind is a very busy place. Um, if you start keeping track of your thoughts, you'll find that some of them uh, are about the past. You might be thinking about something someone said to you yesterday. Uh, others are about the future. You might start thinking about what you're going to have for dinner after your meditation class ends. Uh, there's an evolutionary explanation for this kind of temporal drifting. Uh, we humans are programmed to think about the past so we can learn from it. Uh, we're also programmed to think about the future so we can plan for it. By thinking about the past and future, our evolutionary ancestors increased their chances of surviving and reproducing. And to better understand that logic, I want you to imagine an early human, uh, this would be, um, what, 100,000 years ago, an early human, let's call him Dave. Dave found it easy to stay in the moment, but difficult to think about the past or future. So this is a guy who lived in the moment. 
uh, as a result, he might have been perfectly happy sitting on a rock, staring out at the savannas of Africa, thinking, isn't this all just wonderful? Okay, good for Dave. That's all wonderful. But the problem is on the savannas of Africa, it would have come at a price. It would simultaneously increase Dave's chance of getting eaten, and it would decrease his chance of finding his next meal. So Dave would have perished before creating offspring, and he would have taken his easy to please genes with him. And you're the result of many generations of that kind of phenomenon. So for you to stay in the moment is a very difficult thing to do. But you can either become a Zen master and stay in the moment for extended periods, or a shortcut, you can do this last time meditation in which you imagine when you're doing something that you're doing it for the last time. And it's interesting how you focus on it and how you, you are there present in that moment. Um, and uh, won't last, uh, never does, but it, it's interesting to, experiencing it, to experience it. Um, okay. As a result of doing the last time meditation as part of my stoic practice, uh, I've discovered a new way to have fun. So it's late in the game for me, but I found a new way to have fun. And it's by doing what I call last time resets. Let me explain. Uh, during the pandemic induced lockdown, and we're coming up on the first anniversary of that. Uh, my wife and I started taking lots of long walks around our neighborhood. And because the neighborhood kids were also locked down, they started playing outside their houses a lot of their play involved chalk and sidewalks. On one walk, my wife and I came across a crudely drawn hopscotch game. And I realized that from a stoic point of view, this presented me with a golden opportunity. I had last played hopscotch at maybe age eight. Hadn't done it since. And here before me was a chance to reset my last time event with respect to hopscotch. Indeed, I could move it forward by six decades from age eight to age 68. And so I set off hopping. By my third hop, I was seriously off balance. And to regain it and possibly avoid a trip to the emergency room, I had to step outside the boxes. Game over. But who cares? I not only had a bit of fun, but demonstrated that although I am not as skillful at the game of hopscotch as I once was, I am still very much a player in the game of life. Okay, let's turn our attention to stoic strategies for dealing with life's setbacks. In my most recent stoic book uh, titled The Stoic Challenge, I describe the psychological technique known as framing. And this is a technique that uh, at the end of the 20th century, uh, uh, psychologists like uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman rediscovered. And so, you know, but it was, uh, the Stoics uh, knew about it uh, 2000 years ago. So framing, here's, here's the insight. We may not have control over what setbacks we experience, but we have considerable control over how we frame those setbacks. And by judicious framing, we can minimize the amount of emotional harm that setbacks do us. So one frame you can use is what's called the comedic frame. And you treat an unpleasant experience uh, as a kind of a joke. You make it the basis for a joke so a classic example of that was the philosopher Socrates uh, was walking the streets of Athens as was his, uh, his standard activity. Someone came up and unexpectedly boxed his ears. And so uh, Socrates could have let that upset him, uh, could have gotten very angry, could have punched the other person, but instead put it into a comedic frame. And his comment was, isn't it a shame that when you go out for a walk, you can't know ahead whether or not to wear a helmet, right? Turned it into a joke. And by doing that, prevented himself from getting upset. That's brilliant. Another frame is what I call the game frame. So that first one was the comedic frame. Uh, I, I talk about about half a dozen different frames in uh, the book, The Stoic Challenge, but this is another one, it's called the game frame. 
So I want you to imagine that you're running across the grassy field when someone runs up from behind and tackles you, knocking you to the ground. So how are you going to feel? Well, it depends on what game frame you put it in, which in turn can depend on what game you were playing at the time you got tackled. If you were participating in a cross-country race, you might be traumatized and might even call the police. I was running and some guy ran up behind and tackled me. But if you were instead participating in a football game, and this would be American style football, you might, after getting tackled, respond by jumping up and doing a joyful little dance. You gained eight yards before they tackled you and you might feel like the king of the world. Now, the physical sensations in the two tacklings might have been very similar. Uh, and, but what game frame you put them in will have a profound impact on how they affect you emotionally. So the first guy who said, uh, well, the game I was thinking of was uh, doing cross country. It would be a terrible, terrible thing to have happen. The football player, like I said, might be ecstatic after it happened. It all depends on the frame. The frame I explore in greatest detail in the Stoic Challenge is what I call the Stoic Test Frame. And to use this frame, you imagine that life setbacks are tests administered by the Stoic gods. They test us not to punish us, but to toughen us up. And to pass their tests, you have to do two things. First, you have to come up with a workaround for the setback that they've administered. And second, you have to stay calm and cool while doing so. These tests, I should add, are self-graded. They never give you a report card. You have to figure out for yourself uh, what grade you got on them. And again, the two things, did you find a workaround? And did you stay calm and cool while doing it? I've been experimenting with stoic test strategy with that strategy for years. And I've uh, uh, had some curious uh, consequences as a result. One is that I paradoxically find myself looking forward to experiencing setbacks, you know, which is uh, upside down psychologically. Most people hate setbacks, work hard to avoid them. I work hard to avoid them. I mean, I get... I make sure my car has gas before I go on the freeway. But, you know, even if you're careful, setbacks are going to happen. But I find myself looking forward to them because they give me a chance to develop my skills in dealing with setbacks. So confession, I actually perked up a bit in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I wasn't happy that it happened. But when it did, I felt like a fireman who had practiced putting out fires for years without having a real fire to put out. And now I was in the midst of a real fire. And so the question was, would I rise to the challenge? What does that mean? Would I find workarounds to all the things in my life that changed? And would I stay calm and cool while I did that? Or would I allow myself to get upset? Would I allow myself to get angry? Would I play the role of victim? Or would I rise to the challenge? Another curious side effect of using the stoic test strategy is I actually get a bit nervous when things are going too well in my life. I get a sneaking suspicion that the stoic gods are softening me up ahead of a significant test, that they're fattening me for the kill, as it were. Uh, and this is, has resulted in a very much toned down level of celebration when my life is going unusually smoothly. A third consequence is there are strange consequences, but third consequence is I find myself talking out loud to imaginary stoic gods. Now, again, they are imaginary. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so it, it is not incompatible with religion. It's part of a psychological technique. I find myself talking out loud to these imaginary stoic gods. Sometimes I compliment them for their ingenuity in the test they're, they're, they're giving me. You know, oh, that was an interesting twist on uh, what just happened. And uh, from time to time, I engage in a little bit of low-grade trash talk 
when I quickly and efficiently pass one of their tests, you know, you thought you could make me angry over this? Well, I showed you. Becomes a kind of a personal uh, thing. Uh, okay, let me pause here to emphasize, and I've said this before, uh, the, these gods are imaginary. Uh, why use them then? Because it's a wonderfully effective psychological device. By thinking in these terms, I can, on being set back, uh, being set back, keep my frustration and anger to the minimum. And doing this, I should add, makes it easy for me to come up with a clever workaround for those setbacks. If you're set back and you allow yourself to get angry, it's going to interfere with your ability to think through your options to come up with a great set, a uh, great uh, workaround for a setback. Some would argue that a truly rational person would refuse to invoke imaginary beings in this manner. I would argue that a truly rational person will recognize that we humans are intrinsically irrational as a result of the neural wiring we acquired in our evolutionary past. And being truly rational, he would be perfectly willing to use a psychological tool that would let him minimize the negative uh, impact that this wiring would have on his life. So uh, it's, uh, it's a harmless, it's useful, uh, making uh, use of stoic gods. Um, so a case can be made uh, that believing in imaginary stoic gods and even talking to them isn't a sign of uh, insanity and isn't even a sign of irrationality. Now, a good friend has told me though, that if the stoic gods start talking back to me, that's a different matter altogether. I have something to worry about. Uh, another consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic is that it's let me work on my ability to find and exploit silver linings. Uh, so let me explain. <clears throat> when something bad happens, most people don't even try to look for silver linings. They feel too deflated to do so. And to make things worse, uh, worse, they're convinced that there aren't any silver linings to find, so why even look? But a stoic on being set back will instinctively look for silver linings of unfortunate events. And, he's, and they're almost sure to be there, but it might take a bit of time and energy for you to find them. Because it disrupted and even destroyed many lives, the COVID-19 is a very dark cloud. Uh, it nevertheless had several silver linings. They were there if you look for them. Some of these lin linings occur at the personal level. Item, for lots of people, the pandemic meant less time commuting and more time spent with family. This in turn might have triggered a much needed rethinking of priorities, a silver lining if ever there was one. Item, by, focus, by forcing us out of our usual routines, the pandemic gave us an incentive to discover new ways to spend our time. I, for one, rediscovered cycling, and it's put a whole new dimension onto my existence. Item, by taking things from us, the pandemic revealed to us how many things in our life we were taking for granted including, for example, going to baseball games, hugging elderly relatives, going to lectures like this one in person. You remember the good old days when we used to go to these lectures in person? When life gets back to normal, as it someday presumably will, and we get a chance to do those things again, we will savor them. We will think this is so wonderful. And guess what? Two months later, we'll be taking them for granted again. And that's why you want to be using uh, these stoic psychological strategies to prevent uh, losing what we've gained. Um, so besides those personal uh, silver linings, there were economic silver linings. So yes, lots of people lost their jobs or were forced to close businesses because of the pandemic. But while this was going on, there was a headline inducing upsurge in new business applications. For some savvy individuals, the pandemic represented the golden opportunity that they had long been waiting for. 
new demands were being created and they were going to find a way to uh, satisfy those demands and thereby make a living. There were silver linings at the environmental level uh, in parts of India, for example, people hadn't been able to see the Himalaya mountains for decades because of air pollution. Last spring, the lockdown resulted in a dramatic in decline in that pollution, meaning that much to their astonishment, they could see off in the distance snow-covered mountains, right? And their grandparents might have told them about that, but they just imagined, no, there are no mountains there. This itself would count as a silver lining, but that's only the beginning because the event made people realize that uh, high levels of air pollution shouldn't be regarded as simply a fact of life, that it was possible to reduce pollution. And we'll find out in coming years whether the people of India uh, can take the steps necessary uh, to convert this possibility into a reality. And one last somewhat paradoxical example of a silver lining, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has a silver lining at the public health level. Yes, in health terms, the current pandemic is bad, but it could have been vastly worse. So there's some negative visualization for you. Uh, but here's the wrinkle, here's the silver lining. The pandemic um, serves as a kind of wake up call and by experiencing it, we might, if we're rational, take steps to prevent a far worse pandemic in the future. So we could be doing ourselves a favor. We could change our ways in such a way that when the next pandemic hits, and oh, by the way, there will be one, I have no idea when, we'll be ready for it. Uh, but, you know, being skeptical here, based on our uh, recent behavior, there's a good chance that we'll respond uh, to this, uh, this thought, uh, not by taking those steps, but by simply ignoring them, uh, kicking the football into the future and saying, uh, we'll deal with it when it comes. And with this uh, last remark, which is simultaneously pessimistic and realistic, uh, I'll wrap things up here. I wanna thank you all for hearing me out. Uh, I also wanna thank the Stoic gods for not presenting us with a Stoic test during this lecture. Uh, by not, for example, making the Zoom connection crash. The, God, the Stoic gods are, it turns out, are quite tech savvy. Uh, they have the ability to cause my computer to crash when I'm on deadline, right? Just minutes before they make it crash. And yet we seem to have uh, gotten away with it. And uh, as a uh, college professor, I'm going to leave you all with some homework. Um, if this lecture was your first exposure to Stoicism, I encourage you to give the philosophy a test drive by trying out some of the techniques I've described. Uh, you might discover that the fit between you and, sto and Stoicism is quite comfortable. You might even discover that you are what I call a congenital Stoic, that you've been clumsily using Stoic techniques throughout your life without an understanding of their history or the psychology behind them. And if you showed up for this lecture already a practicing Stoic, <clears throat> My assignment is to listen to some podcasts and do some reading to further develop your, your practice. Stoicism is a very deep well from which you can draw wisdom that will help you flourish in this life, uh, the one life that you have to live. So thank you much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, Couple of questions, or, or we'll we'll open it up for questions. So if you want um, anyone who would like to, you can start putting questions in the chat room. I have one. I have one. I'll just take my moderator prerogative right now. Um, I was wondering if you talk, um, if you think you you mentioned earlier, you don't know why stoicism has had this resurgence. For those of you who don't know, if you go on, there's a number Ryan Holiday and other, and again, a lot of the tech sort of hacker type people have written books on stoicism, the business stoic, the stoic business, per there's all these sort of pop works. But I'm wondering how much of this is the mindfulness because the stuff you're talking about now with the resurgence of the last, and, and again, it almost correlates to the last five or 10 years with mindfulness and you know presence and, and the resurgence of meditation. I'm wondering if it's just the stoicism 
is because there seem to be a lot of common themes, especially the psychological aspects. If you think maybe that's a contributing factor to its, re, you know, its popularity that people are starting to recognize these correspondence again with Buddhism, you mentioned, but also just with that sort of secular mindfulness sort of thing. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So there's uh, been uh, multiple changes in generations since uh, my time, but there seems to be, uh, uh, you know, people are now in just a different, different stage of life. Their stage of life is different than it certainly would have been when I was in their stage of life. And back then, what did you do? You you did what counted as the normal thing. You got a job. You formed a family. Uh, uh, and that's become a, a, a much different thing. So this whole notion on personal development, uh, uh, this whole idea of personal development, personal growth, plays a much bigger role than it did. Um, so uh, Ryan Holiday uh, has taken this and has run with it uh, with uh, considerable success. Uh, and, you know, the tie in though with meditation, for me, it's a natural because when I was writing the book, uh, that was the book before the guide, it was called uh, On Desire. Uh, I actually wrote that thinking I wanted to become a Zen Buddhist. <laughs> it was some kind of midlife crisis. I'm not sure what was going on. And uh, so I actually had done uh, meditation in connection with that. And uh, then uh, in the process of, of doing that, for me, it was going to be um, what's uh, known in academic circles as a twofer. That's two for the price of one. So I was going to get a publication out of it, and I was also going to learn what I needed to, to uh, know to be a Zen Buddhist. Um, but I, in order to, to write the book, I had to research the Stoics and, uh, and came across uh, what they thought and thought, you know, this is a lo lower price of admission than Zen Buddhism would be. Uh, but it was interesting because I had done some meditation, I was aware of how little control I had over my mind. Uh, thoughts kept popping in and they would be there and they would be in my mind. So I would simply take ownership of them. So the, the thought popped into my mind that I wanted something. So I thought, well, that must be what I want. <coughs> and so I would set about trying to, uh, trying to get that thing. So that was an important source of insight for me. And it um, certainly, if you go back to uh, the Buddha and you go back to the Stoics, there were any number of people in the ancient world who have had that same insight. It, it lets you know that however rational you think you are, you have these deeper forces at work within you that are anything but rational. And so one of the tricks to having a good life is to number one, recognize the existence of those deeper forces. And then number two, the, the interesting next thing you do is some people would say, you find a way to eliminate them or you find a way to control them. Uh, the Stoics said, you find a way to harness them and make them work for you. And this Stoic God's uh, strategy that I talked about, this Stoic test strategy, is one way to do that. You sort of, uh, you know, you, you get that whole team spirit going. You know, you think, oh, the bad guys have done one of these and we're going to show them, you know, that, that we, uh, we rule. Uh, I'm not sure I answered your question, but I did answer some question or other. It was in there. I'm going to skip around on the questions a little bit because I want to get one, one, I think, really good one. I'll try to get to everybody's here. But are there any podcasts or YouTube videos? Um, and I, obviously books, there's your own book, but are there any recommendations you would have for someone who wants to get to know more of it, like specific podcasts or YouTube videos or something that they could learn a little bit more about stoicism? Um, well, okay, I'll, I have a website, uh, williambirvin.com, where I link to, to many things I've done. Uh, but there's just a wide open world. There's uh, stoic um, meeting groups. Uh, there, uh, I'm going to give a talk next week, I think, to the Midwest Stoic Association. Uh, there's Stoicon Convention. Um, so like I say, if, you, if you're being a Stoic, you pick the right time to do it because there's a, a wide range of people. It's done in different ways. You know, there are people who are very interested in the original Stoic uh, texts. Uh, 
uh, Massimo Pil Pilucci uh, is, is one such person. And then there's people like Ryan Holiday who are interested in taking Stoicism and giving bite-sized pieces of it without concern for the broader uh, scope of it. Um, I would describe my own work. I have uh, one foot in uh, Stoic uh, philosophy and one foot in psychology. So I'm working that particular vein. So uh, I find it fascinating that modern psychologists have just rediscovered this stuff and given it fancy terms, but the Stoics already uh, already knew it. Uh, but there's a Google Stoic. <laughs> you'll find you'll find and you will there, be yeah. you will be uh, you will be blown away. And and the videos, lots of interesting videos, lots of groups you can join. How, how did you, um, are there any ways that you have updated Stoicism? It's one of the questions. Is there some that you've changed? You know, there's the, the classic view. And then what have you, I, I, I think I'm familiar with it, but if you want to describe, I know that you've done some modifications to some of the, the basic ideas. Yeah, I've, uh, I've done some uh, additions here. So I've come up with, you know, these, um, these, th these strategies. I've come up with a few variations on theirs where I don't think they've, uh, that they came up with them. I may be mistaken, at least I'm not aware of it. And one is uh, called uh, Prospective Retrospection. Uh, funny name, but I can't think of a better name for it. And what you do is uh, you, you take a look at this moment. So we already talked about the last time meditation where you take a look at this moment and then you think to yourself, this could be the last time I'm doing this. Another way to do it is take this very moment and realize that there's a very good chance that someday later in your life, should you live that long, you'll look back at this very moment and you will realize that these are the good old days, okay? And, uh, you know, and you're already doing it, uh, ch chances are, looking back in your life to earlier times, the earlier you, the things you could do, the abilities that you had, the um, opportunities you had, uh, and you look back and you think, man, those were the good old days. Guess what? You're going to do that to your life right now. And you might say, no, 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 I'm a miserable human being. I'm, I'm locked down and, and I have to wear these stupid masks. And okay, let me tell you, if you make it into a nursing home and you're, what, 102 years old and somebody has to come in and feed you and everything else, and you're going to say, Ah, for the good old days of the pandemic. Uh, that was so sweet. I got, I could feed myself and I could take walks and I could, I could do that. Um, so that I think is an effective one. And I, uh, I, I do that periodically. You just reflect on whatever you're doing. Uh, these, if you live long enough, and that's always the if, uh, these, you will look back on these and you will say, I was so lucky to have had that time of my life. So if somebody has a, a more technical question, I guess, is there, is there a relation or what is the relationship between Nietzsche and Stoicism? Is there, a, is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with any connection, but is there, is he saying is there, these things related in some way? I read some Nietzsche as an undergraduate and decided it, reading more was not good for me. Okay. So I, uh, I, I have no answer <laughs> to that particular question. Um, there's somebody else, uh, we, I want to get as much as I can here. Um, Cognitive behavioral therapy and the relationship with that stoicism. Someone's noting: is there a? Is there? It seems like there's a strong connection between these two. What we would call cognitive behavioral therapy and what the Stoics are advocating. Is this a? Is this? Is that a fair comparison? Yes, uh, absolutely fair comparison. Uh, so I get emails from people who have read uh, my books, and sometimes uh, you know they're they're just uh, asking about minor things, clarifications of points, and sometimes though I'll, I'll get an email from somebody. Uh, and it's clear that uh, to give them any advice, I'm in over my head. I'm a doctor, but a wrong kind of doctor, right? So, uh, and so what I'll do then is I'll say, well, you've got this interest in stoicism. And, uh, but, you know, it sounds like a, a really interesting and complex problem. So uh, one thing you might try is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Uh, because it, it has a very stoic uh, feeling to it. And its history, uh, you know, the, the, the early people who developed uh, the therapy were themselves um, 
very much interested in, in the Stoics. So what does Stoicism do? Stoicism takes negative uh, emotions and then tries to figure out a way to think through them. So it applies reasoning in uh, an attempt to deal with negative emotions. And that's what cognitive behavioral therapy does in a very precise form. So, uh, and it's a talking therapy, right? So they, they will simply, ah, you have anxiety. Well, let's talk about your anxieties and let's think, so why does that make you anxious? And in other words, you're gonna get your mind into the game because your, your heart and your gut are telling you one thing and that's great and that's because you're human, right? And you can't help that. But the question is, um, is there rational grounds for uh, the feelings you're having? And apparently it's one of the most effective psychological therapies uh, as well, it should be because it's based on stoicism. It, does. I, it doesn't surprise me. Um, one in this, I think this is an interesting, and maybe it's because we're our, our amount of time here. Um, the student, is it fair to say that stoicism hinders a person because they're in the moment and not working to achieve more? For example, going to college or getting you know furthering an education or getting a promotion or you know focusing on those. So if you're if you're constantly in the moment, just where you are, does that mean you don't you know with the Stoics not people who try to achieve anything, right? You can almost think of it as a stagnation, right? I'm just happy where I am. So why bother doing anything else, right? Why bother pursuing anything? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And uh, that's a question I've thought about. And I, I don't have a concrete answer, but but I, I can, let me, let me tell you some of the, the ways I've explored it. So if you look at the ancient Stoics themselves and the big four Roman Stoics were uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus and Musonius Rufus. He's the lesser known of the four, but still a very important uh, uh, person among them. He was Epictetus's teacher, for instance. So Musonius had his own school. Um, so <clears throat> whenever someone says, you know, if I follow their advice, you know, and if I learn how to, how to enjoy and appreciate the life that I have, then I will be singularly unambitious. I'll just sit here saying, well, this is a, this is an absolutely wonderful life. And why do I need to, to, to work? Why do I need to accomplish anything? Um, so yeah, that, that's what struck me as first at first. But then if you look at the lives of the Roman Stoics, these were real go-getters. I mean, uh, Marcus Aurelius, well, he was the Roman emperor, you know, and, and that's, uh, and he would go out and, and uh, uh, go out with the armies, you know, the armies would be at distant parts of the empire and he, he would go be, uh, be with them if he thought that was uh, uh, the best thing to do. Uh, Seneca, who at present is my favorite uh, Roman Stoic, it, it changes from day to day, but at present he's, uh, uh, in the lead, uh, he was not only a Stoic, uh, he wrote the most of the Roman Stoics. Um, besides being a Stoic, he was a counselor to a Roman emperor. Uh, he was the leading playwright of his time, and he was a first century AD equivalent of a billionaire. So this guy was, was busy. He had uh, lots going on. Uh, Epictetus uh, started a school, which is, like I said, it's a, it's a big undertaking, uh, and uh, wrote uh, a lot, or at least had a student, lectured a lot, and had a student who took uh, notes. Um, and who am I uh, leaving out? Uh, Musonius uh, ran a successful school as well. So these weren't just people who said, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of just happy playing video games, and so that's what I'm going to spend my, my days doing. In Marcus, and it's interesting because it's had an impact on me as well. So um, when I finished writing this book on desire and I had uh, discovered the Stoics and started reading the Stoics, I felt that I, I, there's this notion of a Stoic duty and Marcus is the one who, who brings this out the most. And you know, he says, you're lying there in bed in the morning and then the question you ask yourself is, okay, was I really put here on earth to keep these blankets warm <laughs> or am I gonna get up and, and get to work and do things? And remember, he also has the phrase that I read earlier, love mankind. So if you're a stoic, you're in a, 
a, a really good situation because you've got an angle. You, you, you know how things are, are working. Uh, you, you know uh, what the goal is you should be aiming at. And then you look around you and you realize there are so many people stuck on this hedonic treadmill who are just slogging through their days, making no progress. So uh, you have a duty, a stoic duty to try to help them. Um, so that gives you, if nothing else, that gives you something uh, to, to get you up and, 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 uh, and, and be an active person. Um, and that's certainly true. So that was what I felt coming off uh, writing On Desire. Then very quickly, it was, well, I'm going to, I got to spread the word. The, the People need to know about this uh, philosophy, this stoicism. Uh, and uh, it's a strange thing, but you just, it gives you uh, an objective. It's something you know you've got to do. How come? Because people need it. And you, you, you do what you can to help them. I think we got one time for one more. Um, somebody's asking, uh, this is Jonathan, um, the, you mentioned that the, the goal of stoicism was tranquility, right? And I think, I think part, we did discuss it about the what's in our control, what's not in our control. And I think you add in your book, what's partially in our control. It's yes. not, you know, you add that third phase, but, but the classic is what's, what, what do I have control over? What don't I have control over? And I need to recognize the two. And that's where I get that tranquility in, in some part is related to that, right? That I don't go after things that I clearly have no control over or, or worry about those things. But contemporary Stoics also seem to be talking about virtue. Yes. So what is the, you know, which, I guess, the, I guess the, the simple question is, which is it? Are the Stoics worried about virtue? Or are they worried about tranquility? They're worried, or... worried about both. So okay. the, the virtue is, uh, uh, although this is a, a slight misuse of the word, it's a moral kind of issue. It's uh, what kind of person am I going to be uh, in respect to various personality traits, whereas uh, the uh, uh, tranquility is a psychological component. So do I want a life full of negative emotions? No, why not? Because they don't feel good. You know, envy doesn't feel good. Anger doesn't feel good. They don't feel good. Uh, if you want to have a good life, avoid those emotions is their advice. And can you do both at the same time? Yes, you can. And to be virtuous in, in their sense, you know, you want to be courageous. It's going to require one set of techniques and one set of developing uh, those techniques uh, um, to be um, tranquil, it'll be a different set of stoic techniques. So they're nicely complementary. And I think we've gotten to the end here. We're just, well, we're actually over time. So I do not want to, want to keep you too long, but it looks like uh, we have answered all the questions that are in there. Um, I want to thank you again very much for coming on. I think it's, um, I think if anything is stirred interest in, in stoicism for those. And uh, again, as you've seen, there's a, I can see in the, the names here that there's a handful of my students from the seminar and there's a few from my ancient class who will be coming on stoicism at the end we'll be talking a little bit about it so i think uh, you might have piqued their interest just a little bit in what this stuff is all about so um and if you see there's some people thanking you in the chat so i don't know if you've opened up the chat but they're, they're thanking you for the talk so thank you again and uh i hope to uh maybe bring you back another time Speak yeah, again. thank you very much for the invitation. And thanks to all of you for, uh, I, guess I was going to say coming out to hear me, uh, but no, staying home to hear me and that that works just fine. <laughs>